Um, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first session this week in Sonata, and it's a great session, actually, the one I'm most excited about, accelerating the reskilling revolution. Uh, there could not be anything more important to talk about than labor and education and how to make it a win-win. Um, and I have a great panel here to kick off with me. Um, we're basically going to be looking at the, the way in which the labor markets have evolved post-pandemic, the technological shifts, the green transition, all of the challenges that are added to the challenges that we were already talking about two years ago in sessions like this, um, uh, and the result being that there are about a billion people in the world that are going to need reskilling, training, and lifelong learning by 2030. Um, so we're going to take about 45 minutes or so to talk about what's been done so far, what needs to be done. Um, I'm your moderator. I'm Rana Faruhar from the Financial Times and CNN. Um, and let me just briefly introduce our panel, and then we're going to have some opening remarks um, from Sadia Zahadi, who's the managing director of WEF. So directly um, here to my right is, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, to my left is Bob Moritz, who's the global chairman of PwC USA, International Business Council. Welcome. And to his left is Salil Perkesh, the chief executive officer and managing director of Infosys. Welcome. And... We have Mariam Jamay, am I pronouncing it correctly? The founder and chief executive officer of I Am The Code from the UK. And we also have uh, directly to her left, Jeff, I'm gonna try to get the name right, Maggio Calda? That's good. That's Maggio good. Calda, That's good. okay, <laughs> woo, I got it. Chief executive officer of Coursera. And finally, uh, at the very end, we have Najia Boudin, who is the prime minister of Tunisia. Welcome, Tunisia, welcome minister. Um, so we're going to get started with questions for them in just a minute. But first, I'm going to welcome up Saida, who's off to the left there, to make a few opening comments. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the annual meeting 2022. Thank you for being here. I think our conversation today could not come at a more crucial time. This is one of the most important issues that we're going to be discussing during our time here in the next days. Um, the investment case for education, reskilling, upskilling is so clear. To give one example, um, in our collaboration with um, PwC, uh, 6.3 trillion could be added to global GDP um, through investment in reskilling and upskilling. Uh, another 2.3 million, uh, the 2.3 trillion possible uh, through investment in education 4.0. Those are just some of the financial returns that countries could have. In addition to that, of course, there are very important social returns and many multipliers. Now, this is familiar to all of you. And so two years ago, at the last time that we came together at the annual meeting, we launched the Reskilling Revolution Initiative, a 10-year initiative to reach a billion people with better education, better skills, and better economic opportunities. Two years in, the initiative has reached over 100 million people, but more importantly, started recreating the foundations for the systemic change that we need on this issue. And I hope with all of you and with our panelists and key champions for this initiative, we'll be able to double that progress in this coming year. Thank you, Rana. Back over to you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I also just want to remind everybody that we are live streaming this session. If you want to um, talk on social media about it, it's hashtag WEF2022. And also, uh, we'll be taking questions. I'll have a, a, a pad later on that folks can send questions to. If you're not in the audience, if you are in the audience, there'll be mics running around. So think about what you might want to ask the panel. Um, Bob, I'm going to start with you because you've been involved in this initiative for a really long time. You've also done quite a bit of reskilling and upskilling in your own workforce, which I'm really fascinated by. Um, I guess my question is, talk about priorities. I mean, this is an enormous topic, both at a global level, but also I would imagine at a, at a company level, at an institutional level. How do you so decide where to start um, when you're taking on the task? Yeah, it's a true question. So first and foremost, as we look at the labor force today, one of the biggest issues that's come out of the research, and Sadia mentioned some of the research that we've done, there's an inherent lack of trust between the employer and the employee. And that's part, just part, of the challenges you think about the great resignation that many countries and, and part of the world are dealing with right now. But the reality is, 
with all of the different challenges, the concept of engaging talent more so, enabling more trust and skilling them is an actual multiplier effect. Meaning, if I've got a challenge in terms of the education system, if I've got a challenge in terms of the social disruption that's out there, if I've got a challenge in terms of an upcoming economic challenge, the, this is an and solution. It's not an or or bolt on. So everything that we've done in terms of rebranding ourselves, everything that we've done in terms of the skills and the relevancy, all comes back to how do we get our people better enabled to make them a better asset. Now, if I can, I want to pivot a little bit because the ESG agenda, which is top of mind for everybody, here in Davos, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the E side of the equation. This is an area where we got to focus more so on the S side of the equation, and it comes back to that employee relationship. And it goes to every angle, every angle of the supply chain of talent, going from youth all the way up. Mm -hmm. And as you think about what is needed there, there's three things that we found in our research. Number one, work has to fundamentally be redesigned. Mm -hmm. And by that redesign, it's not only the work you're doing, but actually how the work gets done. Mm -hmm. And if you engage your people in that redesign, you'll have more trust, more connective, more engagement. The second thing, actually upskilling where the skilling exercise actually enables them and gives them more confidence. Our research also has shown that our people that are more likely to leave are the ones lacking the skills. Mm -hmm. Those that have the skills are willing to actually le lean in. They're willing to ask for that promotion. They're willing to engage more, willing to deliver more. So it's a win-win for everybody. And the last point I would say, with everything going in the, um, in the world, you've got to create an environment to have safe conversations. Mm. The reality is there's so much happening and people are taking those social issues into the workplace. And if leadership is not creating an environment for them to actually talk about this stuff, that's another disruption that causes people to actually be frustrated with their job, their work environment, and ultimately move on to something else and hope that it'll be better somewhere else as well. That's a big point. I mean, I almost feel like that's a whole nother <laughs> area. You probably have a team on that, but we'll come back to that point though. Um, so Leo, let me move on to you. Um, you're in tech. Um, we've seen nothing but uh, digital work in the last two years um, with, with a variety of experiences, right? I mean, you know, I'm very happy about being enabled to work wherever I want to. Some people aren't. Some people don't have access. Um, how do you see the landscape? What's going what's gonna to stay with us over the last uh, two years? What's going to change? Yeah, I think... Um Tech and digital have really transformed what we've been doing here in the past couple of years. What we see is the skilling approach, what you can do with your skills has changed completely. The duration of skills has reduced. What used to be 10, 15 years is now just five years. And tech really enables all of us to reskill at speed. And that, that's where we see a huge benefit. Uh, there's a second benefit where the accessibility is massive. Uh, and there we have digital platforms, uh, Coursera being a phenomenal example of that, uh, available in many places which were not previously available. Uh, and there, of course, you combine with content. If you have the right content, uh, you can make a huge impact. Uh, and the third we see is there's not just digital skills that are critical, but there's also skills which have always been of value, communication or human connect. And there's ways to do both of these. So partial in-person, partial digital. Uh, this is becoming the new landscape. And we are seeing tremendous velocity, uh, as Bob was mentioning, in how individuals want to learn. Uh, if they learn faster, they can see bigger impact for themselves in what they're doing. Uh, it's in digital jobs, but it's in all walks of life. And that, that's really the impact we see. We see this continuing for some time. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to tease out some of the best practices with blending uh, human and digital in, in just a minute. But Mariam, let me move on to you. Um, you're teaching girls all over the world how to code. Um, you started in the UK, but you're in how many countries now? 70. 70, okay. Um, they're all using the same platform, yeah? T tell us a little bit about how that works um, and, and how you got started with this mission. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm extremely honored to be in this room. Again, it shows that, um, you know, we are making progress across the world because I think for me to sit here today, thanks to the uh, Sadia Zahidi and her team, is because we are talking inclusion. Uh, it means that I can represent the voice of the marginalized communities all across the world. So I'm extremely honored. Uh, it's always a joy for me to participate on the reskilling platform and talk about it. I think the 
The reason why I do what I do is because I'm extremely frustrated with um, infrastructure, content, uh, but also connectivity for girls uh, who are coming from marginalized communities all across the world, uh, you know, from Senegal to uh, Mombasa, they don't have access. And I think what COVID-19 has showed is the, the fact that the world is not equal. And, and we, girls are, you know, teenagers, teenage pregnancy, for example, extremely high during COVID-19. Mental health for young girls and boys. Uh, you know, I work in refugee camps, thanks to the World Economic Forum. You know, I've been working in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, where they are the first girls, first refugee girls to learn how to code because we young global leaders took our time to go there. And I think what I do is try to tell the world that we can sit here at Davos today, talk about innovation, ESGs, and inclusion and diversity as much as we like, but if we don't have girls using platforms and making sure the platform are easy to be accessible. But also, you know, having, making sure that we, when we give access, we give access meaningfully. That's why we're very proud to have partnered with Coursera in 2020 at Davos to make sure that their platform is being used, but it's not enough. The last mile of education is not being funded. That's what I'm trying to address right now. But the other thing is the fragmented education for boys and girls all across the world, from Asia to Africa, Middle East, everywhere. We expect Bob to hire them, but we're not giving them the skills. Uh, and skills equal money. We are right now in a time where it's absolutely critical. I didn't go to school. Somebody like me was not supposed to be in this room because I didn't, I learned my alphabet when I was 16 years old in a local library in Guildford. I learned how to code seven coding languages in two years. I'm a full stack developer. I can sit down and build an app for you right now because someone invested my, in, my, in my library in Guildford. So I think the point I'm trying to make, if we're gonna talk about digital skills and reskilling people, make sure the data Sadia just shows go up by 2030, we need to meaningfully give people access, but invest in the last mile of education so girls like me can sit down here in 2030 sharing their stories. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> Love that. OK, Jeff, you've got a little bit of a hard act to follow oh. here. But, <laughs> um, but you, you've worked with Mariam, and, yeah. um, and you've worked with many other um, educators. What lessons do you take from the last couple of years? How do we make sure that we build on all this digital learning that's happened and not lose it? There's. Um, there's a lot of consternation out there. They're clearly, someone, Klaus actually last night at the dinner said, uh, the world has never faced this array of challenges all at the same time. I mean, from pandemics to wars to food crises and growing inequality. So it's easy to be a little despondent. But you know what we're talking about here is actual progress, mm. actual progress. It's not just the idea of what needs to be done. Things are getting done. Mm. And I think the way that this has been unlocked, I mean, the World Economic Forum talks about five drivers of social mobility. Technology, education, healthcare, jobs, and institutions. And when I look at those five, I see them as a system. And what happened during the pandemic is that technology really unlocked the possibility that people could continue to learn even as 1.6 billion had their campuses closed. Mm -hmm. So a huge infusion of people practicing and being introduced to online learning. Mm. And it's a platform. And I think, Mariam, what you said, I think it's really important. Pl yeah. Platforms, it's a model that is very powerful because a platform is something, whether it's Coursera or Skillsoft or, or any other platform, what it allows is for a collection of institutions or individuals to supply solutions to problems that they've never even become aware of. People are using Coursera to solve problems we don't know exist. And that's the greatest thing about it, is the ability to have many institutions supply important content when, with partner with institutions, because it is a last mile piece as well. It's the content plus the institutional support that allows people to have access to learning and to create value and solve problems that, that, that the world needs solved. So we, we look at the learning piece, and we say technology has opened up access to learning in a way that wasn't previously possible. And with remote and hybrid work, which I think is this, a second major permanent shift mm -hmm. from the pandemic, it's not every job, and it's not immediate, but many, many jobs, including the highest paid, most flexible jobs, which often can be done remotely, are gonna be the ones that create new opportunities for people because of remote work. So if technology has allowed anyone anywhere greater chance of being able to learn, we say skills pay the bills. You said skills earn money. I mean. If, if people have access to learn the skills 
And then if those skills can be translated into economic opportunity, because jobs become more available to people in regions where there have not historically been job opportunities, we have the possibility through institutional collaboration to both skill and create economic opportunity for populations who never had access to either one of those. And, and it's happening. So I, I'm very optimistic. I mean, there's a lot of tough things out there, mm. but we are actually seeing real progress being made. And we see that we see that I, I think we're seeing the patterns of the solution mm. and it's, it's happening. Okay, I'm going to come back to you in a minute on the hybrid point, but Najla, I want to bring you in. Um, you are, you're in a very unique position. You're Prime Minister of Tunisia, but you've held many senior positions in education. Um, you know, the, the, the conversation about national competitiveness is always about education and skills, yeah. right? It's always about how can we train a 21st century workforce? Every country has that conversation. So what lessons can you share from Tunisia's experience? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about the Tunisian experience. And uh, first of all, I would like to, to tell you that uh, in my government, we have eight female ministers. And uh, the ministers of finance, Mr. and Mrs. Siham is here, the minister of energy, of industry, of mining, of trade, culture, and family. And uh, all of us, and myself, we are prou a proud fruit of the Tunisian education system. Since uh, our independence, Tunisia has always and continues to put its compass on education, and our education system provided opportunities for all Tunisians to rise the social lift. And more importantly, it provided equal opportunities for girls and boys, and the credo was and is nobody behind. So this uh, strategic choice continues today, and uh, despite a huge pressure on our public finances, and uh, Tunisia ranks, still ranks first globally in terms of government funding by pupil in secondary, uh, education as per percentage of GDP uh, per capita, and uh, we rank it third on the list of countries with high numbers of women working in science and one of the well-advanced countries in terms of women's rights. I would like to, to, to say here that the world, as you all know, is transforming deeply with global megatrends such as the rising rule of technology, climate change, demographic shifts, urbanization, and globalization of value chains. And the ed education systems are requested to respond to emerging and future needs. And the picture appears to be contrasting, but the challenges are tremendous. Mm -hmm. I would like to say here that on the one hand, we in Tunisia, do well globally in terms of availability and quality of human resources. Mm. We rank eighth in education overall and 35 in human capital and research according to the Global Innovation Index. We are also ranked second globally in the percentage of graduates in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And on the other hand, we have to draft drastically improve the impact of our education, research and innovation in transforming knowledge into economic value and social fare. In short, we produce good knowledge, but unfortunately, we absorb little of it. Mm. We produce good doctors, engineers, and scientists, but this talent are living the country, and uh, the brain drain is taking a very concerning magnitude. One third of our engineers leave the country, open graduation, and the rates are more concerning in areas such as ICT, where entire cohorts of freshly graduates are leaving the country. This is a net loss of the investment, and, most, and moreover, a big shortfall for the countries need to achieve prosperity for its people. And in our developing countries, not only reskilling is needed, but also retaining the skilled workforce 
is of critical importance. Mm. This is what I would like to mm. say here. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, well, that's a good sort of scene setting. Um, let me come back around and follow up on some of the points that you all have made and, and kind of connect some of them. Um, Bob, you talked about uh, ESG and, and skilling being a part of ESG, um, which is, is everywhere. I mean, I feel like that is part of almost every conversation that we're having this week in Davos and certainly everything I'm writing about. Um, is the skilling part harder than other parts of ESG? And what do, what do employees, what do stakeholders, what do customers expect from you guys in that area? How, how is it evolving? So I don't think it's any harder. It's just another technical or tactical skill that has to be addressed. So the question comes back to, and I want to go to where Miriam and, and Jeff went in particular, which mm -hmm. is how do you make sure people have the ability to connect in and avail themselves to those learning opportunities to enable lifelong learning. Number one. Number two, the quality of the education, no matter where it may come from, education systems at the corporate level or in any other digital format or virtual format, has to be of sufficient quality mm. to enable a changed behavior. Mm. And that changed behavior then enables then an opportunity from an economic perspective, personal yeah. economics as well as otherwise. The, the third piece that's got to be done here, though, is you've got to continue to ensure that there's entrepreneurship coming out of that. Innovation, new job creation, et cetera. And this goes to Sadia's point in terms of where that economic opportunity is. Yeah. And so encouraging that is another systemic issue. Otherwise, you'll have refugees leaving, where our citizens of countries, for example, in Tunisia, are saying, OK, yeah. I've got to move elsewhere. Where is the opportunity going to be for me? And we're going to see that a lot more, especially in Eastern Europe, as you look at the Russia-Ukraine situation right now. And the last point I would say is, how do you actually empower the youth mm. to not necessarily be just the beneficiaries of this, but actually drive this, own this, and enable this. Mm. And as we step back, and, and Miriam knows this, Jeff knows this, I'm part of an organization called Generation Unlimited, which is under UNICEF and the UN, where we're focused on those four things. And the reason we're focused on that is not to take a great example that Miriam has, but actually figure out how do you scale it. Because mm. to Jeff's point, we're really seeing a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and innovation and, and optimism, but it's not fast enough. It's not big enough yet. We've got to scale as fast as we possibly can. I'm curious if any of you have seen an idea or are taking part in an idea that is scaling, you know, that you, that you can see. What, what can we learn? What are the, what's the I'll, silver thread? I'll there? happily pick it up yeah. here. So one of the things that this organization Gen U is doing is in <laughs> India right now, that connection point has actually enabled itself to connect to 300 million people. Hmm. So now we're talking real numbers mm. in terms of how do you actually get the, 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 those that are um, underprivileged, et cetera, that are not equipped. You've got to connect them and then incent them to lean into that opportunity mm. and make it easy and available to them to actually take advantage of that and what's going on. And the lesson learned becomes this. It becomes a public-private youth partnership mm. to get everybody aligned to actually get people equipped to avail themselves to it, mm. leveraging it, and benefiting from it. And it's the output that comes from that, not the connectivity, but the output. Miriam, you're, you're not. Yeah, I think this week you will hear quite a lot about the shared humanity. Uh, yep. you, know, you hear that everywhere in rooms. And I think it takes some time, kindness, compassion, and empathy to really think about these people. You have to go to Kakuma Refugee Camp to realize the camp has been there for 32 years. 258,000 people uh, you know, will be useless to the United Kingdom, to Germany, to all these countries, because they don't have the skills. And the time is so critical for us to change our mindset in the way we give people, but don't give them because we feel sorry for them, right. because we are giving them because coding, for example, uh, you know, make economic sense. You know, right now, Google is, for example, hiring people in London. They're paying them $100,000 a year a 25 years old young man. What I'm trying to do here, I'm building the, the world's the largest pipeline of coders in the world. In 2030, you'll come back to me and say, Lady Mariam, I would like to have 100 Java coders. I will give them to you. But if you don't invest now, 2030, don't ask me for my Java coders because I will not give them to you. And so we need to really start thinking economics and, and how job creations create work. In Rwanda, you know, they have a Rwanda coding academy. Mm. And you have young boys who are so smart and girls who are coding. I mean, they're really building the really amazing applications and solutions. Mm. But the world don't know about this. And I, for, for me to sit here to share these stories, they're real stories. But the refugees, we must include the refugees in everything we do. But they're, they're smart people. They really don't know. They know how to do things. We need to give them the jobs, give them the opportunity, the content, the infrastructure, and 
the really, really thing that everyone is struggling right now is connectivity. Yeah. It's not everyone who's got Wi-Fi. Yeah. It's not everyone who can go and connect to the Wi-Fi. So we really need to look into our heart again and, and think about what can we do to take care of our people? Because as I said to my president, if you don't take care of people, they will take care of you. Mm. Jeff, how do you go about getting, you know, across all your platforms, getting the services to people who don't have connectivity? I mean, where do you, you know, who are you working with? Where, yeah, tell us the process. Yeah, the, um, a lot of it has to do with institutional collaboration. <clears throat> um, just quickly on the speed and scale yeah. piece. We have seen extraordinary need arise quickly and, um, you know, pretty amazing scale. The, in 2020, when the pandemic broke out, UNESCO said in April about 1.6 billion students had their campuses closed. Um, we collaborated with 3,000 universities. In seven months, 3,000 universities had 3 million students take 30 million courses wow. in seven months. So. This, so the, the lesson is work with institutions who have access to populations in need and supplement that with fundamental connectivity. Mm. On the question of, and by the way, just in terms of what has happened recently with the Ukrainian crisis, uh, the, the Ministry of Education contacted us. They said, we have a number of displaced students now, um, and can, can we somehow provide continuity of learning? Within 30 days, we were live with 135 universities, and now 10,000 students have logged 30,000 courses mm. in 30 days. So it's, we really are seeing the patterns of incredible speed and scale. Uh, and then the final thing I'll just say with respect to connectivity, it is essential. When, when people ask me, like, what role must governments play in trying to bridge inequality gaps, uh, as with water and electricity and, um, and good sanitation, Fundamental primary education is critical. For individuals who don't have the basic literacy and numeracy, they're going to be left further and further behind by those that do. Because you cannot avail yourself of these types of platforms if you don't have the fundamental knowledge and skills to do it when you're young, kind of K through 12. Mm -hmm. So I'd say invest in K through 12. And then on the connectivity side, not only is learning opportunity accessible through technology, job opportunities increasingly are accessible through technology. So if you don't have connectivity, you're starving both the access to the skill development and the access to the economic opportunity. That's a problem that, that governments need to, to, uh, to, to solve, and I think they can do it with telecom providers, zero-based rating where certain websites, you go, to the, you go to your telecom operators and say, if you want to provide telecom service, mobile service in our country, you know, there's going to be no data fee Mm. If, if our people access these educational-based sites. We see a number of countries mm. doing this. And then the, the, the final thing I'll just mention is um, it's not an either or. Uh, we have a number of countries uh, in the Middle East and Latin America, around the world, where there's not continuous access to broadband, but there's intermittent access uh -huh. to broadband. There's not continuous access to power, but there's intermittent access to power. If you can charge a mobile device long enough for it to run for an hour or two, and if you can get to a hot spot where you can download courses, yeah. you can work offline pretty much anywhere, go through the courses, do your assessments, and when you get back to a hot spot, you can sync it back up. So you at least provide, and I think Columbia has done an excellent job of this, provide public hot spots where hmm. people, you know, hopefully not too far from where people are located, where you can at least have intermittent access to the internet. It does not have to be all the time. And with data plans, it's pretty expensive. Wi-Fi is really valuable. Backbones to public Wi-Fi hotspots mm. is very valuable. In Nigeria, 30% mm. of monthly expected uh, of uh, average income is, 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 the, um, uh, uh, is required to buy two gigabytes of data. La last time I checked, this was like a couple of years ago. It can be very expensive to buy data with, uh, with lower disposable income. And so I think it's really important to have these public Wi-Fi hotspots. Really interesting. I mean, everything that you all are saying is you're kind of getting at the edges of basically a fundamental reshaping of the educational system, but also a, a, it seems like much closer ties between education and business in okay. some ways. So I'm curious, maybe just to get thoughts from the whole group about how you see what has happened over the last two years, shifting 
K through 12, shifting um, whether we are going to continue to see four-year colleges or whether we're going to see more of these sort of six in four programs where you know you get an associates and then you work, or or are we going to see just kind of hybrid forever and what is that going to look like? Or credentials? Because so Leo, as you pointed out, um, you know the the skills that you need are changing very quickly. So do we need just a, a, a kind of pod of credentials that you add on? Maybe you can start. No, it's it's. Uh... So the, the, the points you made are a vast array of, of changes that are going on. I think first, what we had as education, I don't think is disappearing, but there is tremendous amounts that is being added on. And so the overall number of people that can access the skill-based training is expanding. Hmm. What, what we are seeing is a lot of recruitment uh, is focused more on skills mm -hmm. than simply education. But, but it's not to say that education in the traditional sense is disappearing. We, we're enhancing it massively now. Uh, and here, uh, everything that we've seen with online learning, we, we find of value in expanding what is available. But we also find tremendous need for traditional connected learning mm -hmm. because there is a value in that social interaction of learning that we see as well. Uh, and what people are now figuring out is what is the most efficient way, what is the most scalable way of doing both. Mm. So we had a bit of, with what we saw in the last two years, the pendulum shifting almost entirely to digital. Yeah. And now we're figuring out there's obviously things lacking if it's only digital. Uh, and there we, we see the, the future developing. So for us, you know, when, when we see graduates joining uh, our company, uh, we, we can see with online learning that some of the team building skills uh, have been uh, missed out on a couple mm. of years. So mm. we're sort of in, uh, uh, overcompensating for that uh, in, in the shorter term to make that happen. But having said that, the overall education that's available now between traditional skills, online, uh, in person, uh, is making sure that more and more people have access to it. Mm. And that's phenomenal. Mm. That's true. Absolutely. Najla, would you like to jump in on this? question at all? Yeah, of course. Um, let me tell you that uh, we in Tunisia, sorry for focusing on our experience in Tunisia. No, no, it's great. We have experienced online learning. We have one, the Tunisian university, virtual university, and uh, uh, since um, 20 years. And uh, we are uh, um, developing many of spooks, MOOCs, um, for developing life skills, language skills, and we have linked it with the certification of skills. This is very important mm. for our our youth to to have an uh, to have a job, yeah. and uh, and uh, we have many of um, very nice pepits, uh, especially in young universities, and they have developed uh, MOOCs and spooks for improving language like French. Uh, in collaboration with your French universities and uh, many of, for instance, m uh, about 600 engineer graduates uh, in uh, Chinese uh, universities are, uh, uh, are attending the, yeah. the MOOCs and the SPOOCs uh, in, uh, in a small university in Tunisia. And this is, we are very proud of that. We have very nice pipettes in Tunisia nowadays according and uh, huh. uh, uh, in relation with uh, online uh, education. That's interesting. So it's education, online education is becoming an export in yeah, for the, of for the course. country. Of we can gener generate gener resources with that and we need generation of resources. And if you permit, uh, I would like to, uh, to, take, to tell you more about our uh, priority and how we prioritize um, our um, our um, education in uh, in Tunisia uh, according according all the the financial uh, difficulties that we are challenging nowadays and our uh, dilemma is uh, following in in times of economic difficulties um, while the education is at the top priorities uh, and why we spend uh, a lot of uh, on education. The question is how to dedicate more resources uh, to reforms that are not quick wins. Yeah, uh, yeah. How to keep uh, investment uh, in basic education at, and at the same time invest more in lifelong learning mm. and uh, reskilling. 
mm. but uh, the transformation is inevitable and uh, as for us the the path uh, the path is clear we are uh, uh, continuing to invest massively in uh, in education and uh, mainly to move into high high value added segment in uh, select economic priority sectors uh, with a target to to promote growth and employment for mm. for everybody and nobody behind as uh, i told you before lovely um bob you had a point i think and then Marion. i do the entire education system is going through a number of different shifts to your question and i want to point out four really quickly number one you've got the concept of lifelong learning being more accepted by society at large and that goes to the governments as much as it goes to the corporate so this public private partnership is really important number two you have business that I think because of the demands from an ESG perspective are actually much more engaged on willingness to help with the connectivity, the quality, and the ultimate education. And so you see that benefit. And you've got a couple like Cosera with Jeff and what I described. Microsoft is another great example where they have something called Passport to Earnings, mm. which connects the world in terms of what's happening with that connectivity or even without that connectivity. The third thing that's important is every institution now is looking at how do I help with skills enhancement? And yes, certification or accreditation against those skills. And that's going to be really important. But what's going to be needed is we got to have mobility of those credentials mm. move from place to place to place. Yeah. Because if Salil actually says, OK, I'm going to only hire people that have my credentials, and I'm going to only hire people that have my credentials, we'll never have the economic mm. upside that um, uh, Sadia talked about uh, earlier today. And last but not least is this concept of prioritization now with the education system and being top of mind. It's a crowded agenda. It's where you started. And unless we actually bake that into everything we're doing, we're going to miss the opportunity. Yeah. If you look at the amount of public and private partnership economic contributions that have gone into the education system, it's a minuscule in the last two and a half years to what it needs to be. And obviously, all of that went to COVID and pandemic and everything else. But actually, there was some upside here. If a little bit more was provided in, we'd actually get that scalability and ultimately that connectivity that Sadia talked about mm. when we first opened up the session. Mariam, do you want to make a comment? I mean, absolutely. I'm just picking up what the Prime Minister said. You know, we need to think about certification as a dignity. When young girls have certifications, they feel so proud of themselves. Mm. And they really like, you know, you can see this on their faces. They're like, oh, I got this certificate. I've got this certificate. So I think, again, we need to always think about the 75 million young people who are in education but don't have jobs right now. And so we need to also change our mindset in saying, what can we do to give them access to Coursera? At I Am The Code, what we have done, we, get, you know, we have a 12 weeks blended curriculum, where the, because of the fragmented education these young people have been having for so many years, we made it structured so they can go through coding skills, and they go to life skills and leadership skills. They learn really something very, very pra practical. And at the end of the 12 weeks, you know, they can start getting jobs. Or You can really see this. I think what I'm, tr I'm calling on, on, again, I'll share humanity, but when we're designing solutions, when we are creating these platforms, we need to think about people at the end. The refugee girls I work with, over 7,000 right now in Kakuma, they are so proud of themselves because they can get certification. All of that need to be talked about this week. Then when we go back into our offices, design things that are simple, that can be used offline, online, and make sure that you know, it's understandable, uh, you know, it's dignified, and we can help people ultimately get jobs. OK. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I think I'd like to open it up to the floor now for questions. And we already have a bunch. So um, if we can get some mics here and then over there. We've got one coming here. Over you. Hi, uh, Ronnie Shruvala, Upgrad, India. Um, great conversation, everyone. Just two questions. I think we've been talking a lot about the need, and Bob, you've lifelined the scope exactly of uh, how large and the impact can be. But do we all see the challenge that actually the actual consumer, the person who really needs to change their lives, haven't yet actually found the sense of urgency to do that? Mm -hmm. And what in our ecosystem that we're creating, where the soul is willing, the body is willing, but from that point of view, Salih, you run one of the largest IT companies in the world. But yet, uh, you still also run one of the largest training campuses in the world because the people you get in still, you feel, have not on their own upskilled. So that was just one question of how are we going to be able to create the sense of urgency to actually meet that? Because the two paths have to meet. And I think the second one for everyone here, because we've heard a lot about lifelong learning, is the importance of soft skills. Because I think yeah. 
if we're just going to conquer skills over the next 10 years, and we know that 50% of all change is going to happen through soft skills, what's our thought and persuasion That's on a that? great, Thank great you. point. Who wants to grab that? I'll part? start with this, maybe, and uh, Bob can join in. So thanks, Ronnie. I think you, you have tremendous experience in this area with what, what you've created. Uh, what we see uh, on the urgency is absolutely appropriate, what you described. Uh, there's a set of people who have a tremendous urgency, but a large number of people don't have it. And part of it is creating a certain level of excitement and fun with the content in addition to depth in the content. So what we do, for example, at, uh, in our uh, university set up in Mysore, and we also have an online uh, platform within the company, uh, is to make sure that that ability to learn in that engaged manner comes about. Uh, there is definitely an interest that we see because uh, in our own small context, people immediately jump onto projects when they finish some internal certification. And there's a value to that. But the urgency certainly needs to be pushed more, and we need to think of how it can be done. On the soft skills, uh, I'll come back with Bob. Go ahead. Yeah, the, um, the point I want to pick on is that we've got to actually segment the populations of the world that need help in different ways. Yeah. To your point, Somebody who is employed today, and I'm going to use PwC as an example, you want them to lean more into the upskilling that's necessary. And you've got to make it interesting and exciting enough for them to want to lean into those opportunities. And the way we thought about it, we created a program called New World, New Skills, where we said, look, if you're going to lean in, because you're all worried about job security, if you're going to lean into that opportunity, we're not going to guarantee you a job, but I am going to increase the probability that you're going to be employable at PwC or anywhere else. And it's going to be citizen-led, meaning our employees, not top-down, bottom-up. And this way, take away the passive resistance, because anytime something's built at the center mm -hmm. and forced on people, human behavior is such that you're not going to get that upside. Yeah. But let's go to the other side of the equation, which you've got to take some of the walls out of the system. So those that are underprivileged in various parts of the world, there may be a family that says, my daughter should be staying home or getting married at a really early age, and Kelly doesn't have an availability and shouldn't go to school or avail themselves to those online courses. So we've actually got to knock that wall down, which actually doesn't go to the individual. It goes to the surrounding environment that's around them that we've got to attack mm -hmm. and say, here's the opportunity. So there's a whole cascading of communication that has to happen to create the incentive for people to want to do this on a going forward basis. And to your latter point on soft skills, you have to look at the totality of this. right? There's digital skills, which we've talked a lot about. There's ESG skills that are going to be needed as we transform work going forward. The softer skills are going to enable this to happen and it goes a little bit to where I opened up, one of the other things that's going to be needed is the soft skills to enable that environment to have conversations around social issues. Mm. And if we don't have the EQ to actually have those conversations, trust me, people are having the conversations at home. You're going to want to have them at work as well. And we got leadership that's going to need to actually equip for that to happen. And we're ill-equipped to have that happen. A lot of our survey data actually tells us that probably 70% of the organizations today are not allowing for those conversations to happen in their organizations, mm. which is another negative to the willingness to actually be employed by that organization as well. Mm. Boy, I'd love to hear you at some point in Davos on, on that conversation and, and some of the th things you've seen. Um, we have Mike over here. Yep. Camila Camilo from uh, Global Shapers Community. Um, basically, you are talking about non-formal, non-formal, informal education. Um, you're talking about certificates, but this small business is the major responsible for jobs for like youth, and they don't recognize this though informal and non-formal uh, certification. Mm -hmm. So, how, uh, what the way to make the government recognize those and the companies also? Because if we if we are like reskilling people, yeah. but the employee, the employers don't recognize the certificates, though it doesn't work. You know that's a great question, and I want to actually add another beat to that. And Jeff, if you want to jump in, something I notice even in the formal um, education processes that are public and private, I'm thinking about like the IBM P Tech schools, or you know, it, it's not it's not a one size fits all. Um, there are a lot of companies doing different things. Sometimes the companies don't know each other's process. So, how do we get to a more centralized place while still allowing some flexibility? I think it gets to what Salil was talking about. Um, I'd say traditionally, formal education has been almost the only type of uh, system and credential recognized. 
So if you have a credential from the formal education system, then you get certain you know, opportunities. And if you don't, then you don't. A lot of people talk about, oh, is the degree dead? Is it micro-credentials? You know, we sort of see a hybrid everything. Um, we have, at, at Coursera, we work with universities. Uh, interestingly, universities create content, but industry also creates content. Mm. Universities consume the content, and also industry consumes the content. We have companies like, uh, like uh, Infosys, PwC, et cetera, <coughs> using university content to upskill their employees. At the same time, we have universities. Well, NMIMS University in India is a great example. They offer a BTEC, a Bachelor's of Technology. In that curriculum, they have integrated industry content for credit, where when you graduate, you get a BTEC degree with honors in data science, and that honors track is actually coming from industry content provided on a platform, you know, like in this case, Coursera. But again, it doesn't have to be Coursera. There are other platforms. So the ability to have hybrid learning online and on campus is here to stay. The ability to have hybrid credentials. Do, is it a college degree or is it a micro-credential? It's both. You literally graduate with a college degree and a micro-credential, and you actually got credit towards your college degree by doing that industry credential. Mm. And then at work, you're upskilling, taking courses, from, you know, algorithms from Princeton. It is, it is really blending together in, and I think, a spectacular way. And I think what's going to happen is individuals over the course of their lives will build a portfolio of credentials which will be valued for different reasons. You might have a bachelor's degree that says something about your understanding of, of, of liberal arts and, and sort of human sort of history and what it means to be a human. And you might have a CFA, which is a certified financial analyst, which means you understand certain things about finance and investing. And then you might have a professional certificate from IBM in artificial intelligence. And that's all part of your portfolio of credentials that say to an employer, these are the things that I know, and if you think that that's valuable, you know, please hire me or give me a chance to accelerate my career. I love that idea, Mary. But, but I think she makes a great point uh, on, on certifications because many, not many governments recognize some of the certifications, especially if you are a refugee or living in urban Kenya or you know, really tough places, because you have accumulated so many certifications. And if you don't show something tangible, you're not going to get jobs. I think also is the policymakers, the digital, the minister of technology in, in, in countries to actually you know, make this a mandatory thing like Kenya right now, they've made coding compulsory. The government of Kenya has made comp coding compulsory. Rwanda is the same. So many countries are making technology, and now you can have access to Coursera courses. I mean, over 197, you know, universities are, are inside Coursera. For a young girl to have, a, a, you know, a, a certificate from MIT, it's a big deal for her and her family, you know, in a sitting in, in Mombasa. So I think we also need to ask government to recognize this lifelong learning certificate, so they don't, you know, stop the, the you know, the people who are learning, you know, in their own time. There were two things that were embedded in your question. One was the sort of credentialing and the recognition of that. The WEF actually has an initiative underway to actually think about what are the sectors and what are the skills that are needed in that sectors, and then can we actually connect the dots with governments to actually recognize those oh. kind of skill sets that are necessary. What's the name of that initiative? Uh, actually, I, don't, I can't remember Starting the name, soon. but actually it's um, uh, Sadi and the team are actually working this yeah. right now. But what was also embedded in your question was actually the importance of the small and medium-sized enterprises, mm -hmm. right? And let's not forget that, because government actually working with business has to create the entrepreneurial mindset to create the jobs on the other side. Because if we do a great job of getting the billion people skilled, and if there's no jobs, you're going to have more social unrest than we have today. So let's not forget this is a supply and a demand issue that we actually have to be focusing on both of those. And government business have a role to play on that entrepreneur and job creation side as well. Awesome. There was a gentleman with a question up in front, and then we'll take one over here. Thank you. Excellent insights this morning. Thank you for that. My name is Dipankar Trihan. I also represent the Global Shapers community. My question is, while there's a lot of conversation around skilling and education for people who are in some format in formal sector of education and training, what about the people who are unaccounted for? How do we extend education and skilling to them? So just to put things in perspective, in India alone, about 175 million people are unaccounted for. They're not in education, they're not in training, they're not in jobs. How do we extend education and skill initiatives to them? Mm, Thank you. Great question. Who wants to grab that? I mean, I can, I can uh, <clears throat> that's a very good point. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, that's what I've been fighting for for how many years now? You are right. The last mile of education, we must invest in that. Right now, we're all comfortable in, in creating <coughs> platforms and giving it to the people who look like us and, and you know, universities and communities. 
But when you go to places where you know, there is no infrastructure, meaning it's a building, connectivity, uh, you know, train the trainers, all of that, you know, is, it will be part of our shared humanity, I've been saying the whole morning. So again, it's our job to redesign what we are trying to do here. The way to reach out to those girls is me traveling you know, sev seven hours from London to Nairobi, getting into the refugee camp, talking to all the schools. And, and you need to train the teachers on the ground because the refugee girls, you know, they may end up getting married if we, if we don't intervene. So I'm doing an intervention, a really critical intervention with the UNHCR who are really trying to do their best. But these refugees, when they want to resettle in America, or in London, you know, unless they are useful to the government of those countries, they will not resettle. They will stay in detention centers. You know, I've been to detention centers all across the world. It's awful. It's absolutely horrible to sit in a detention center for six months, nine months, one year, two years waiting for somebody to come and rescue you. No one is coming, right? Nobody's coming. So I think that's why we need to really think about the last mile of education. Even the Coursera platform is, is, is answering the needs. How can we make it offline, online? How can we make it different languages? Uh, for these people to have access to it. But also we need to take the plane or we need to go to the people. Technology must go to the people, it must not come to us. We need to go and give it to the young girls and boys all across the world. And right now, it's absolutely urgent. Mm -hmm. It's so urgent for us to go out there because the data uh, we are working towards right now, for me, I will not be satisfied in 2030 until you know, all of my girls uh, are included in this data because this data will be inaccurate in 2030 if we have not included the left behind and the missing millions you just mentioned. Okay, final question here. Hi, um, I'm a global shaper from Japan. My name is Atoka. Um, I'm a founder of a liberal arts summer program in Japan. And so um, I'm wondering, so in this continuously changing and evolving um, society, I believe that um, what we learned today can already be considered outdated in a few years. Mm -hmm. And so in that, um, in, that, in that case, how do you manage to provide education or education platforms that doesn't just, con um, that doesn't just educate or educate the people to be equipped for the now, but to be um, equipped for the future? Mm -hmm. Salil, do you have, or Bob, or sorry, uh, Jeff, yeah. go ahead. Uh, maybe I'll start off sure. with Jeff and Alan. I think um, critical, uh, critical point that, that you mentioned, uh, we, we clearly see that what was learned in the past, which was with us for, say, 10, 15 years today, the duration is much shorter. So one of the things which I think are important to learn uh, as, as uh, students and as all through life uh, is really the ability to learn. The, the thing that's critical is to realize that whatever you learn today uh, is going to change. Mm. And, and that's not something which many students in school, at least when we were in school, was, was that evident. It, it was evident that we had to learn uh, what was around us, but not to learn how to learn ongoing. And that's a little bit of a mindset change which needs to come into more school-level uh, thinking. Uh, because then people are ready to, to do this. Uh, it's a bit of a shock because uh, you, you suddenly realize when you're in the, in the work uh, environment that, that literally in five, seven years, uh, you, you are not at the right skill level. Uh, and that, that's not something that people are used to. Uh, so it's re almost critical to internalize th that you really need to learn how to learn on an ongoing basis. Okay. And I, I totally agree with that. The, the other thing I would encourage you to think about is what you might think of as the half-life of certain knowledge and skills. There are certain things that I learned um, a long time ago when I was in college and high school that haven't changed. You know, physics has changed a bit, but the basics of physics have not changed. The basics of biology have not changed. Mathematics, guess what? Most mathematics is not changing. It's very important to know mathematics and statistics. So I would, I would, a lot of liberal arts, understanding what it means to be a human, it's changing a bit because our context is changing, but there are a lot of things that are very durable and they don't need to change all the time. And I would, I think a lot of traditional systems that maybe aren't so agile should focus on those more durable, transferable skills and complement it with a higher velocity training platform for the tools that change fast, the techniques that change fast, a lot of the ways that people team and technology is changing fast and complement those th two things together. I, I really think that's also a, a hybrid kind of answer. There are things that are durable and there are things that have a very high rate of obsolescence. Try to have 
different mechanisms to bring those to your students. I just want to add at the, at the World Academy, at the reskilling platform, we have something called the, the taxonomy of uh, education. I would recommend you go and have a look at that. It's a really comprehensive report we've done uh, a couple of years ago, last year. It's really fantastic because you can see what's happening today, what's happening in the next couple of years. And we would love to you know, hear from you as a shaper community, if you can help us shape this. Because, you know, for me to sit here as a code, I'm 47 years old, maybe in about in 50, what, in 2030, it would be totally different. So please have a look at the taxonomy of, uh, you know, of the education we have at the reskilling platform. It's really fantastic. Okay, well, we are at time. I feel like we could have gone on several more hours in this conversation, but you know, my takeaway is in challenge opportunity, you yeah. know? I mean, I can already see a lot of brainstorming going on between our panelists and the audience um, and within the conversation we've had today. So thanks for sharing. Thank you for being here. And I'm sure we're gonna be talking again about reskilling next year at Davos as well. Yeah.